when the Buddha tells about his own search for awakening as he goes from episode to episode. There's a phrase that he keeps repeating. He says, in search of what is skillful. When he left home, he went out in search of what is skillful. He went to study with the different teachers. He was in search of what is skillful. When the two teachers didn't satisfy him, he went off in search of what is skillful and went to the banks of the Naranjala River to practice his austerities. And it shows that all along his path he was convinced that skillful action was what was going to lead to awakening. He never seems to have abandoned that, that approach, even though there are people at the time who said there's nothing you can do to gain awakening. It either just happens on its own, or it doesn't happen at all. But neither of those is an approach that you can test, that you can experiment with, when you assume that it's through your actions that you can achieve awakening. You have to have that assumption if you're going to try different approaches. And then the search is for what is skillful, what kind of action is skillful. This is why his instructions to Rahula, when Rahula was seven, you can take as a basic set of instructions on how to practice on how to meditate. Notice your intention. Notice what you're doing and the results of what you're doing right now, the results that appear right now and the results that appear over time. And try to act on the intention to be skillful, in other words, not to harm yourself, not to harm others. And then you learn from your actions what works and what doesn't work. That was the approach the Buddha took in his own practice all the way up to the end. That's where it gets especially interesting. He finally gets the mind into right concentration after realizing that this is the path. This is the first factor of the eight, or the first fold of the eightfold path that he came across. This must be one of the factors of the path, which is right concentration. He got the mind into right concentration, and he started having various knowledges arising. The first was knowledge of his previous lives. The second was knowledge of how beings all over the universe die and then are reborn in line with their karma. In other parts of the canon he talks about how there are people who, having had first the first knowledge or that second knowledge, had just set themselves up in business. It seemed that they had previous lifetimes and they became teachers just on the basis of that. They have seen the truth that we either do have previous lifetimes or some people would run slam against a a life where they couldn't remember anything. There's a state of mind that's called um, non-perception, or perceptionless, where you have no perception of anything at all. If your memory of your previous lifetime goes back and hits that wall, you come back with the conclusion, well, there was, a, there was a beginning point in time, and then from that point in time we've had many lifetimes. But the Buddha didn't slip into that, that mode of gaining that knowledge and then claiming to have enough to set himself up in business. His question basically was, what's the most skillful thing to do with this knowledge? First, where did this knowledge come from? It came from his concentrated mind. That was good to notice. And then secondly, what was the best thing to do with this knowledge? In case of knowledge of his previous lifetimes, the next question was, well, does this apply to him only, and, or does it apply to other beings? And is there any pattern here? And so that's what led to a second knowledge. And again, there were people who had that kind of knowledge who would then set themselves up in business as teachers. But the Buddha wasn't satisfied there. The next question was, what do you do with this knowledge? And he realized that the insight he got into action, the insight into karma, what is, it was based on intentions, and the intentions in turn were based on views. This is what led to good rebirths, mixed rebirths, bad rebirths. And the next question that came to his mind, well, what kind of views would take you away from having to be reborn? Is there a kind of view, is there a kind of action that leads to the end of views and the end of actions? And 
That's how he started looking into the Four Noble Truths, which again are an application of the principle of karma. What are you doing right now that's causing suffering? And what can you do to put an end to suffering? Gained insight into the Four Noble Truths, and then he also gained a similar kind of insight in what's called the asavas, the fermentations of the mind. What are these things that bubble up into the mind? Well, there's, there's sensuality, there are views, and then there's ignorance. And so this is where he was able to let go of his views and attain full awakening. So in each case, no matter how amazing the knowledge was, he never stopped there. He kept saying, what's the best thing to do here? And at the same time, he was very clear of what he had done to get there. So this is something we should keep in mind all the way through our own practice, beginning with the practice of generosity, the practice of virtue, and on through meditation. You want to be very clear about what you're doing, why you're doing it, what you anticipate, and then the results you actually get. And then as you get results, you have to learn how to evaluate them. Are these good results or are these bad results? If something was bad, you try to figure out, okay, wait, what went wrong? Was it the intention? Was it the implementation of the intention? Was there any greed, anger, or delusion in my mind that I didn't see? And then when you start getting knowledge in this way, the next question is, what do you do with the knowledge? What should always be? Let's keep looking back at the mind again to see if we can get the mind into a state where it's more and more still, more and more clear. See, to see if you can detect any place where there's still stress, where there's still a burden on the mind that you're creating. And it's good that we get used to applying this principle from the very beginning of our practice. And don't forget to apply it as we get to the more refined states the concentration can give rise to, because there is that tendency. You hit the infinitude of space and you say, there we are. Some people call that the unconditioned, like the space in this room. You've got a spacey feeling in the mind, so that that's must be it. This is unconditioned. We've arrived. But the question always should be, what did you do to get there? And if you did something to get there, then it's not the unconditioned. So let me back up and rephrase that. If you're doing something to get there, is there anything you're doing to maintain that? What are you doing as you stay in that state? And the Buddha says, if you really look carefully, you see that there is a perception that holds you there. And the perception is something you keep repeatedly doing. It's an activity. This can't be the unconditioned. And if you see any wavering in that perception, then you can let it go. That gets replaced by the perception of just awareness, knowing, knowing, knowing. And again, it's very easy to think that you've hit some sort of metaphysical absolute here. And the people who believe that they've reached a state of awareness where the awareness is all-embracing and things arise and pass away, and it doesn't touch the purity of that awareness. If they think that's the unconditioned, they can lead them in all kinds of weird ideas that, in other words, no matter what you do now, it's not going to have any effect. It's not going to touch that purity of your awareness. And this is where get people feel that they can break the precepts now, because their awareness is pure. But again, they forget to check and see, are you doing something to maintain this state? There's one sutta where the Buddha talks about going through various levels of meditation. In each case, you settle into that level, settle into that level of awareness. You indulge in it, you learn to enjoy it. And then you start asking that question, where's the disturbance here? And you look around, you usually find the disturbance is based on the perception that's holding you there. It's an activity you're doing. Then the next question is, can you stop that activity, just drop it, and see what happens. And it's this principle that takes you all the way to awakening. Because after you've learned very carefully to watch for your actions and to watch for your results, keep that 
framework of that questioning in mind, you finally get to something that is not maintained through any fabrication, through any intention at all. And you know that because you've detected even the most subtle kinds of intentions that can come with these very refined levels of concentration. So whatever comes up in your meditation, these are the questions you ask. Always keep thinking of it in terms of karma. What did you do to get there? What insight did you gain into the process of action as you got there? And now that you've got this knowledge, what's the most skillful thing to do with it? Simply trying to label it. What was that? Was that a metaphysical absolute? Was that awakening? What was that? That's not the most skillful thing you do with it. The most skillful thing is to look, okay, what did I learn about action? What skill did I develop? And now that I've gained some results from that skill, what's the best thing to do with that knowledge, the best things to do with those results? You keep testing things, testing things over and over like this. until you finally find something that holds up to the test. So what this means is you have to learn how to develop your powers of observation so you can rely on, you can trust your test of things. Because nobody can step into your mind and say, yep, that's it, that's awakening, or whatever. That's this level of jhana, that's that level of insight. And when you come right down to it, those labels don't really mean anything. What's really meaningful is if you see that there is a state where there is no more stress and you know for sure because you've tested it again and again and again. As I mentioned this morning, that story that Jamahabu tells where he'd been meditating for a long time, contemplating the unattractiveness of the body, until the thought struck him that you know, for a long time he hadn't been feeling any, any thoughts of lust any feelings of lust. So the question arose, had he gone beyond lust? So he decided to test it, thought of a beautiful body, thought of that beautiful body right next to him, Every, anything he could think of that would normally have provoked his lust in the past. And he stuck with it and stuck with it for four days. And then finally on the fourth day there was this little movement in the mind of being attracted to that image of the body. That's when he knew that lust was still not gone. Now, most people wouldn't have waited to the fourth day, and maybe a couple hours of testing and say, that's it, I passed the test. And that's all they would have gotten, some misunderstanding, because they hadn't really been ardent enough in testing things. So whatever comes up, you've got to keep testing it in this way, and particularly when there's an experience that seems to open up the mind. Because we're not here just for peak experiences, we're here to understand what do these experiences teach us about the principle of action? What did you do? What insight allowed you to gain that state? What did you drop? If you can't see that, then the peak experience is not anything you've really learned anything from. You've got to have an understanding of karma that opens up certain things in the mind that hadn't been opened up before, things that you just saw were they were there, and you didn't realize that there were actually actions and intentions that you were doing. And if you can't see through these intentions, watch them in action, then you haven't really learned anything. So remember, it's all about karma. This is why the Buddha teaches about karma as his most basic principle, and it follows all the way through. He never drops it. In fact, it's the consistency with which he keeps applying this teaching. That's what's so distinctive about his own practice and the way he teaches us to practice. Whatever comes up, what did you do? What can you do with it? Those are the questions that lead to progress. Those are the questions that help you to test things until you find something that stands up to the test and you can really trust. <laughs>